Good morning, folks. This is Todd Coburn of Cal Poly Pomona with Arrow 3271's Lecture 22 on Shear Resistant Beams. Now this title, Shear Resistant Beams, is a little bit misleading because it sounds like the beam is more resistant to shear, which isn't really true. All we're really doing is classifying beams. We could call this non-buckling beams. The idea of a shear resistant beam is a beam that is designed to resist shear such that it doesn't buckle. The good news is this is just a rehash of ideas that we already understand and that we've been studying. However, because lightweight structural design where we have that thin web assumption where we're assuming that the webs carry only shear and that the normal resistance to load is just in the lumped areas that represent often stringers and things like that. What we're really going to be doing is focusing on beams that are designed such that our assumption of a thin web with lumped areas is appropriate and some specialized or focused methods of handling that, all of which we've done in the past, and yet we're going to focus on making sure we understand how those are used today. This is some examples of shear resistant beams. So up at the upper left, you just have a web fastened to an upper and lower cap, both of which are T's. It looks like the web is thin, but not super thin. Maybe it's thick enough so it doesn't buckle. That may make it a shear resistant beam. Many of these others have corrugations or other things in order to stiffen that beam so that it resists shear and those could also be classified as shear resistant beams. Here are some typical cap designs that you might see in industry and how those might be idealized. The most common cap is probably a T or a J section cap looking something like this. What we really want is a wide flanged section like this. And we'll often give it that little return lift. That makes it a lot better for crippling because these are often critical in crippling. We have a web going like this. I don't know why my pen always does this for this deal. And we'd put another T down here uh, or J. The problem is we often have something attaching and so we'll just put a little angle on the bottom. Therefore if we want to attach something to this side of the beam like the stiffeners we can having a fastener through here and a fastener through here. See how that works? Okay that's a typical beam. And what we have often if we're analyzing a beam and bending if it's a normal continuous section we would Note that we have a linear distribution of stress and strain. If we go into the plastic range, it becomes nonlinear. Okay, those are some ideas we already have studied and should understand. This is a slide you've seen before where we introduced shear stresses. This is just a simply supported beam. You see the two reactions of the two pin supports. It's shown deeper than we normally see because it's a big old eye section. Remember we focused on this little section. We drew a free body diagram. We focused on the lower piece and then we use that to apply some calculus to calculate or to develop our VQ over I width formula. Once again, this equation calculates the shear stress in our section at any point moving from top to bottom or moving along the flanges, right? If we focus here, we see as we move through the section, the shear stress at any point is a function of the area above that point and the y minus y bar of that area, right? That's what this formula said. This is V Q over I T or width dimension. This is true when if we look at our section, if all of the section has area that is effective in resisting axial load. If it's effective in resisting axial load, it has area. If it has area, then it's y minus y bar of that area 
makes the shear flow the shear flow change through the section and hence the shear stress. Whether we move from top to bottom as we did in the first lecture on this or moving through the flanges as we did on the flange, third and flange section, this formula applies. Any time we have a beam though where we used our lumped assumption, meaning we've idealized the same section as maybe a cap and a cap and a thin web. As this web here gets thinner and thinner, this idealization becomes increasingly accurate. It still is off, but it gets closer and closer to the real answer. This is valid up until buckling and things like this. This assumption here, as our web gets thinner, this assumption of the web not carrying any normal stress, it becomes more and more accurate. Now what happens is if this gets so thin it can buckle. If it buckles it still will resist shear but it will not resist hardly any axial load. So this assumption is valid when our web is thin and it's valid when we have stability problems with that. Our caps since they're they have area that we can't ignore for the purposes of carrying normal load, then they have area, and since they have area, they have a y minus y bar, which means they have q, which means they change the shear stress. That's why even if we assume there's no shear stress in the area itself, the web attached to it will carry shear stress if it's attached to this based on how much load that thing transfers. Okay, this is our VQ over IT formula. Now we're going to, on the next slide, we're going to look at this a little further, but we're going to focus on what happens when we have a thin web or a web that is thin enough. So once again, we start with the same simply supported beam, same basic cross section, but now what we're going to say is our cross section, the web is thinner and thinner and thinner. We're focusing on this. We draw our free body diagram as we did before. We see that same distribution of stresses, but we could just take this triangle of stresses that we see here, right? We have a linear distribution of stress here. We could just take that and turn into the equivalent force. The equivalent force of all of that distribution is going to occur at two-thirds of this dimension here, right? two-thirds of that dimension and we could take the equivalent of all this and replace it here at two-thirds. We could take the equivalent of all this, place it here at two-thirds, take the equivalent of all this, place it here at two-thirds. If we did that, we could draw it this way. Once again, we have the two forces and we have the shear. There's also a shear on this piece, right? Now, if we just focused, since we've replaced that distributed load with that point, those point forces, we're calling those forces C for the compressive force and T for the tensile force and the shear stress F. We can sum our forces and we find out that our forces are equal to the change in the cap loads. You can see here that the cap load, just like we did with the delta P method, so going from one point to the next, our cap load here is something and the cap load over here is less. And if that's true, the only thing resisting it is that shear stress and the force from the shear stress is F times its area, which is B dx. So we find is that our shear stress is related to the change in force in the cap, just like we studied previously in the delta P method. In fact, the delta P method really is this shear resistant beam kind of approach. And that means we have this balance. We're going to look at this further throughout this lecture. What this tells us is if we sum our forces, sum our moments, we find that the shear stress is roughly V over BH. Remember this is just that formula. Remember we started out when we first started studying shear back in 3, 2, 6, 1, we first said that the shear stress is equal to P over A. But later we found out that this is really only for direct stresses like on fasteners and where there's really short distances. If we have shear accumulating over distance then we have a change in moment. If we have a change in moment then our shear stress is actually VQ over IT. Now it's still true 
it's still true that this is the average stress but we found that the peak stress is VQ over IT. Remember, when we look at shear stresses on a section, we get a, on a rectangular section, we get a distribution like this. But the average would be this peak is VQ over IT. In fact, actually, VQ over IT tells us what the stress is anywhere because at each point we have a different Q. But our approximate formula, P over A, which we see here, V, which is our force over BH, that is the average of all this stuff. So this is still true for the average, it's just not true for the peak. Remember for a rectangular section, we saw that the max shear stress is actually uh, three halves or one and a half times the, the P over A. Remember that? That's if we plug in all the values on a rectangular section, we find out that this is gives us what the peak is. The average is this value. The peak is this value, which is calculated by evaluating VQ over IT. So where, so if this is just the average stress down here, when can we use this assumption? Why is it valid? Let's take a look at that a little bit further. Remember, if we have a rectangular cross-section, then our cross-section looks like this shown on the left. When we apply our, our formula is VQ over IT, and when we apply that to the section, we find a parabolic distribution of shear stress that goes from zero to the maximum at the centroid and back to zero. So if we look through this section, we see that the shear stress changes significantly as we move from top to bottom. Now, if we have an I section, and let's say it's a fat I section, what happens is we're going to get the same, if you look at this distribution, parabolic distribution of stress, we have nearly that same value. Imagine this. Let's say we have a wide section. Let's say we have a section that mirrors these dimensions. If it mirrors those dimensions, then actually our shear stress, because it's wide, VQ over IT, our our T dimension is wide, therefore you get a parabolic distribution of stress but it doesn't go very high. If we had a narrower section like this one here, then we would also get a parabolic distribution of stress, right? But because it's divided by a smaller number, it's bigger everywhere. When we have this section, what we have is a parabolic distribution of stress. It's trying to do this if it were as wide as this, that's where it would be going. But what happens is it's going along its merry way until it gets to this point. And then all of a sudden the thickness is less. So the shear stress jumps up because now we're dividing by a smaller number. And then it continues on with the same distribution. See how it's progressing like this? It can progress as like that again. Then down here it jumps back down and comes down here. So that's what we see here. We see we have a shear stress parabolic distribution that is headed like this, but because the width changes, it pops up from this point and then continues on its parabolic distribution. See how that works? Now, if we get thinner, we see the same thing, but this change in stress, the thinner it gets, the bigger this jump. This jump was a small jump because this went from wide to only a little narrower. This is a larger jump because this got narrower. If we get even narrower, and let's say our caps become even thinner, we see that this piece here becomes less significant and this jump becomes even greater. We could draw it like this. Say, hey, this is going like this, and then it jumps up a lot, and then it hardly changes. It's still a this is all this is still a parabolic distribution but because the area because now if you look here the area of each little piece as we move down is so small you haven't actually increased a lot of area from top to bottom and by the time you get to the centroid the area change remember the area change which is small is getting having less and less effect as you have your y bar move down so actually this is parabolic but it's nearly flat nearly flat. That's the key.
what we see is while VQ over IT, if you look at this rightmost column, is valid for all of these, we find that actually the shear stress, the average shear stress, becomes very close to the maximum shear stress because the change, most of the shear stress is carried by the web and the change from the top to the bottom of the web is not very significant. So what happens is while that P over A is valid only for direct shear, but if our web gets super thin, which doesn't just mean rectangular, having a, a thin web with a rectangular section will just go back to that same parabolic distribution we saw up at the top. But if we have a significant piece of the area is in the caps, is up away from the centroid, and our web is thin, then what happens is most of the shear is carried in the web, and our P over A approximate, our average stress, P over A, is nearly the same as our maximum stress, VQ over IT. So whenever we have a thin web where we have lumped areas, like what you see in this last row, whenever we have a lumped area and a thin web, we can use this to approximate our max shear stress and just assume that the shear stress is constant. Remember, whether we have a fat or a thin section, it doesn't matter. These will all have a parabolic distribution of stress. What's different is that we have caps with significant area that are far away from the centroid with a web that is relatively thin. Because we have lumped area up here, lumped area up here, it's even more true if we have a section like this. As our cap area gets larger and as our skin thickness gets smaller, that makes this assumption more and more accurate. This is always strictly correct, but this becomes closer and closer to reality as those caps get larger in area and the web gets thinner in thickness. That is our, that is why we're able to use our lumped assumption and be fairly accurate when we have thin structures. And this is the foundation of this whole shear resistant beam kind of idea our delta P method idea, and all of our lumped assumptions that we've been using since 3261. If we look at a section like this, you can see we could just take P over A is approximately the shear stress, and we know it's close to the uh, real number. What H can we use? Well, you can use the total height of this thing like from the bottom to the top. But remember, this is not precisely correct, so it's common to use our H, which is from the centroid of the cap to the centroid of the cap. Usually we call that H, and that's what we'd use in this formula. So we're actually neglecting a little piece of our area. Remember, we're just taking HT, we're using that as our area. So by using a slightly less area than we really have, that kind of accounts for the shear stress because our VQ over IT formula will get a little peaking that we're missing with this formula. So that keeps it simple and keeps it accurate. Okay. In this particular case, you could just come up with a wild assumption. Hey, we're just going to assume it's 90% of V over H. Or you could go and use, like if you take the centroid of the caps like this, you could just use the distance between those. If you called that H, you could just use V over HT, which is around 90-ish percent of the area, right? In this particular case over to the right, you'll notice when we have a shear force that's downward, the equivalent shear flows are downward, which means actually they have to come upward in this flange. You'll notice now this flange has to carry the shear that's applied and it has to carry this additional, which is going in the same way. So actually this means it's going to have to carry even more shear as you see here. This is just a wild assumption using that that shear web is 1.2 times V over HT. In this case, you can't just say V over H. 
because we have this augmenting, uh, increasing the shear stress that's going to occur down here because it's coming from these flanges. Okay, does that make sense? So we're actually not going to use any of these formulas except this first one, V over HT. And what we're going to try and have a clever choice of what H we're going to use so that the shear stress that we calculate is relatively accurate. Just to recap, are we going to use these three formulas? No. All we're going to use when we're using this assumption is V over HT or more commonly we'll calculate the shear flow V over H. <laughs> but the question is, what H are we going to use? And we will often use the centroid, the distance between the centroids of the caps. That's actually the best thing probably to use. Sometimes we'll use the distance between fasteners when that's approximately the difference between the centroids because that's easy to find. This is a really good time to ask ourselves this question. Rather than saying, hey, what am I supposed to get? What answer did Coburn write in the bottom of the homework? Instead of saying, what's the right answer? You want to start asking yourself, what is an appropriate assumption? What is an appropriate assumption? Recognizing there are myriads of approximate and semi-approximate numbers bringing ourselves to the question, what is appropriate? Is this assumption appropriate? How is it different than other assumptions? If there's a different answer posted as the quote unquote right answer, is the assumption you're using a valid assumption? What is, how is it better? How is it worse? Okay. Let's take a look at how we might analyze these. Let's say we have a beam loaded in shear, and we're just going to ignore the moment on this for a moment, okay? If we have a shear force on the right and a shear force on the left, obviously we're developing a moment on one of the two sides. If we draw an exploded free body diagram, exploded free body diagram means we take all the little pieces of this and we rip it apart. So imagine that, imagine that other picture kind of being exploded. So you see the upper cap and the lower cap pulled away from the web and pull away from this, the stiffeners and the continuing structure. See that? Now, if we applied our delta P method, noticing that let's say that our V is applied as shown on, let me just make this a little better. What this really means is if we have a shear force applied over here on the right side of the beam as we see here, then actually what we're going to get back here is we're going to get a moment and a shear, right? And if that's true, then the shear on this side is coming into the beam. The shear flow is just going to be V over H, where H is our distance between the centroid of the caps as shown right here right? This Q is just V over H. And since we have a thin web, this Q is constant in the web. That means if this is reacting here, that means it's going to be re equal and opposite, equal and opposite, equal and opposite. And the shear coming out on this side will be Q times H. We also see that we have the same, because this is a shear element, right? Whatever goes this way goes this way and so on because they're so romantic, that means these guys are going like this, equal and opposite. Now, since we applied the shear over here, there's no moment back here. That means there's no axial load on this end of the cap. But now the cap going from here to here, if we sum our forces in the x direction, right, that means zero and then we have, going in this direction, we have Q times this distance. What's this distance? It's W, right? Minus or plus QW. And then we have whatever delta P, whatever change in cap force is, minus delta P equals zero. This says that delta P equals the QW. Does that make sense? Delta P equals QW. So that gives us the force. And if we look down here, we do the same thing. And then by symmetry, we can see that's the same number. We don't have to calculate it. Then we come over here and we see that this delta P perfectly balances this moment, which would be going like this. So that's how we would break this apart 
and draw an exploded free body diagram. Now it's going to be difficult for me to measure that in Blackboard. But when we're turning in our homework, when we're doing written tests, being able to break this apart and draw these free body diagrams is an important skill for aerospace professionals. We said that. We said that. Make sense? We can extend this idea further by studying another simple supported beam with a pair of point loads. Now this beam has been expanded. It's not our little, so the way we used to see these kind of beams is we would see a little beam like this with a couple roller supports and two point loads. But this is expanded because what we have is a thin webbed beam similar to what we'd see in a floor beam or something. Now we know already, looking at this, this can be idealized. If these webs are very thin, we can idealize this as a thin web with a cap, with lumped cap areas, right? We can ask ourselves these kind of questions. If only the caps have axial stiffness, what carries the axial load? Yes, the caps do. If only the web has shear stress, then that means the, sh the, the web carries all of the shear. Does the shear vary in the web? Well, because it's thin, we're assuming it, if it has no axial area, then that means it will not vary in the web. However, every time we pass something that's lumped area, it can change, or something that introduces or pulls out shear load. The force in the cap can change because the cap is attached to the web. If the cap were not attached to the web, then whatever load at one end will be the same as the load at the other end. But since the cap is attached to the skin, if we look at a piece of cap like this one here, then we see if there's a load here, we'll call this P1 and a load here, P2, but we have this shear flow along here. What this means is Q this force plus this times whatever distance it acts on is going to give you that force. That's the, and this is rather simple. This is summing forces, free body diagram, sum of forces in the x equals zero to calculate what that is. But every time we're attached to something like this web that can transfer shear stress, that means the cap can change. What happens if the web buckles? If the web buckles, that will change its relative stiffness, but it won't change that it can still carry shear flow. So actually, even though we call this lecture shear resistant beams, the same principles we learned today will apply when we get to buckling beams in the next lecture. Now, you'll notice once we figure out how much shear stress is in a web, then we then will check what it buckles at, whether or not the web is buckling. And for the web not to buckle, remember what that is a function is the A over B ratio. In this case, it's the H W ratio, right? H over W ratio or the W over H ratio. And so by breaking up, adding more panels, for example, if we have a beam with a whole a beam like this one we saw last with a couple point loads or something we see this is so long this will buckle even if it's only carrying shear at a very low number if we break it up into two panels we're going to get a higher buckling allowable into four panels an even higher buckling allowable in fact the more times we break it up the more the higher the buckling allowable we get the kind of pseudo ideal is when we have nearly a square panel. That's where we got, remember, we see this, and that's where we got a, uh, a buckling coefficient that was reasonable and not the minimum kind of value. If we go longer than that, we're going to approach the minimum value. And if we go really short, it's going to be a more a function of the H, and it's not going to change a lot either. Okay? So what uh, was proposed some time ago by Wagner is, hey, in order for these stiffeners to actually divide these panels up, this web into smaller panels, it should have a certain moment of inertia perpendicular to the skin. And so he developed 
this little formula here. He said that the vertical stiffener should have a moment of inertia of about this value, where W is the, the spacing between stiffeners. If it varies, you can just use the average spacing would be fine. Thickness is the thickness of the web, because what it's equating is the eye of the stiffener to the basically the eye of the web, and that's kind of buried in this formula. But So that's the thickness of the web. The shear is V. H is the distance between the cap centroids and E of the stiffener, EST, is actually just the modulus of elasticity of the vertical stiffener. What this means is if you're designing a beam and you want to break it up into smaller panels, you can use this little design formula to come up with a minimum I that your stiffener should have in order to adequately break the thing up into panels. When these panels are relatively thin, it doesn't take a really big beefy stiffener in order to break it up so often just little angles thin angles are fine for breaking these panels up but this gives us a criterion for checking that now once we have calculated what the shear stress is in the web the v over ht we then will evaluate whether or not it's buckling now if it's buckling that means we're going to have to go to a higher method like what we're going to cover next time. We could call that failure, writing margin of safety against buckling. That would be the pansy approach, and that's often done. It's simple. Just design the beam to be thicker, the web to be thicker, but that will result in heavy structures. We're going to find out that if the web is buckling, it's this, the beam can still carry quite a bit more load, and that's what we'll study next lecture. In this particular lecture, we're studying shear resistant beams, which means beams that don't buckle. And so when we evaluate our critical buckling stress, we're going to expect the margin to be positive or else this is not a shear resistant beam. Okay. If we have shear, we can check the allowable of that panel for shear. If we have bending, we can check the allowable for bending. This is using the same ideas that we studied and should have mastered back in lecture 17. You can ask yourself if we use the lumped area thin web approach is there bending stress in the web? No. Now there will be bending stress on the web but if we're using this assumption what we're doing is pretending that the web has no axial area that means all of the bending stresses are carried in the caps none in the web. That keeps our analysis quite simple and we just use that shear allowable for the web itself. So our bending stress in the web then is zero and we can just write a margin of safety on buckling of the web for shear alone. If we don't use a lumped assumption then we would have bending stress in the web and we would have to combine the stress ratios for shear and bending as we did before. So what does that mean? Well Let's say we have a beam like the one we had in the last slide. We had a beam that looked like this. It had two stiffeners. It had loads of each stiffener. It had reactions like this. We could go and analyze what is the shear stress in each of these, right? And if we're using a lumped assumption, all we have to do is calculate the allowable for that size of panel between the stiffeners using this and once we have the allowable we can write a margin of safety on buckling and if it doesn't buckle we could also write a margin of safety FSU against FS minus one right whichever is lower of those two margins is the critical margin of safety for shear either the FSU over FS over the F critical over FS minus one. Those are the two dominant margins if we're using this lumped assumption. That keeps our analysis simple. Now if we actually analyze the beam, if we didn't use the lumped assumption, then when we take each one of these webs, let's just take the middle web, and we say, oh, this particular web, or let's take one of these side webs actually, because the middle web is no shear. This actually is in shear, and it's in bending. What that means is we have to get the stress ratios FS against its allowable, and we need to get the stress ratio, right, we're using FS to get RS, and then we're getting the stress ratio for bending, we calculate our bending stress, turn that into a 
stress ratio for bending once we use this kind of thing to get the allowable critical buckling allowable and then we have to combine those using this to evaluate whether or not the thing buckles make sense that's the kind of analysis we will do when we're using this lumped approach now this is just a word on web splices if we have a lap splice like this that means you have one web just laid over the other and then fastened together what is the fo we if we have a, a force v applied to this what is the force per fastener well in this case you'll notice all of these fasteners it looks like one two three four five six seven eight nine ten 24 fasteners are transferring the load from the one skin to the other so that v over 24 tells you the force per fastener right now if we have a butt splice we see well actually if we have a shear force on this thing then actually you'll see that only these fasteners are transferring so from this web it has to go through these fasteners into these splice plates and then it comes out these fasteners so that means we have the shear divided by the number of these fasteners and we have if it's because it's a lap splice if we look down on the thing that means we have a splice plate a splice plate and the web stops and continues like this that means we've got two rows two rows that means the load comes from here it's going here so divided by the number of fasteners and we've got two shear planes that's going to be our force per rivet so this is worth noting also actually the load really won't distribute that evenly initially it will tend to peak up at like the first fastener in various places as we saw when we studied uh, shear on fasteners a week or so ago and we're going to neglect that what happens is if it does start to peak often that rivet will yield a little bit and then share the load okay and also this it neglects like eccentricities doing to the moment that's caused when you transfer the load whenever remember we ignore the moment associated with these fastened webs together whenever the webs are thin so if we wanted to design for increased shear capability one way is to increase more stiffeners vertical stiffeners we can also add horizontal stiffeners like we see here anything that gets the panels down to a roughly rectangular shape rectangular shape panel will be give you like an optimum kind of or near optimum buckling allowable for that panel it doesn't mean they all have to be square it just means that can give you some benefit and often will aim for that kind of idea shear stress on the web if we have a shear applied here we can say this h1 and this h2 our shear stress is roughly constant but then when you go and you analyze you can say well I can analyze this panel for its FS critical and I can analyze this panel and actually the panel would be to like the fastener center lines would be ideal or the best way to idealize that we can call this the upper panel call this the lower panel we'll say this is H upper and H lower okay if we get those two allowables you could say well our shear stress is this or if you want the total capability you could say well I'm going to take this shear stress of the upper panel times its oh let's do this let's call this H1 forget this crap we'll call this H upper and this one down here H lower then we could say this times H upper times T upper is how much shear force in the is carried in the upper web and the shear force in the lower web is going to be equal to this allowable of this lower web times its H lower T lower and that tells you how much force what's the total force carried by the web it's just the V carried by the lower plus the V carried by the upper and if you want to know the average shear stress or the 
average shear stress capability of the web, that means that would just be the summation of those two or that force over the total HT kind of thing. Does that make sense? So this, you'll notice as we put vertical stiffeners, more of those, we get better shear, uh, shear allowables, critical buckling allowables, and we can even put horizontal stiffeners to, to make that better. I see have seen a lot of vertical stiffeners in industry. It's a lot less common to put horizontal stiffeners because they're heavy and they don't, I mean, they don't provide the same level of trade-off. The time when they'll do that is if they have like a big cutout or something. Sometimes they'll put a stiffener like that to improve the capability, but we'll see a lot of vertical stiffeners in, in our work and less of the horizontal stiffeners, but that's how you'd handle it. So those are some basic concepts. The main ideas here is reinforcing our lumped assumption and our calculations associated with that, right? So once again, you should now be getting to where you can quite readily analyze lumped sections. For example, if we have a beam like this, and let's say we have lumped caps like that, and we have an H, it's the distance between the centroids, and let's say this is W. Let's say we apply a force to this end V, and now we want to know what's your cap load. You should say, oh, well, the shear flow in the web is just going to be, shear flow in the web is just V over H. That's going to be, that means if we take a little piece, let's just take a tiny little piece of beam here, and we have this V applied, that means the reactive shear flow Q is just this V over H. That means if we look at the panel alone, that's what the Q is. And since this is a shear panel, then these romantic little shear flows will look like this. This is the same Q, right? Okay, that means if we take the cap, we say, well, there's no load over here, but now this action reaction pair means I have a Q on this guy moving this way, and therefore we can see we're going to get a delta P. What's the delta P? It's just equal to Q times W. And due to symmetry, we see we have the exact same thing down here except this is now going to be delta P like this, and this is zero. And then if we come to the wall, we see that means our support is going to be get these delta P's, right? These same delta P's and this shear flow, which means we're going to have this V and this moment reacting it. That's our reactions and this is our exploded free body diagram. This should become near second nature. It's rather easy and it will set the groundwork for what we're going to do next time when we start looking at thin web beams that actually buckle. That's all I have. Enjoy.